That was 100 years ago. Yes, it's a, it's a mm -hmm. lovely picture. It's, they were both foreign students. They weren't married. They were just young, uh, real new, uh, new arriving missionaries, and they were both. They were sent to this school for these. Uh, there must have been about eight of them, and they're studying. They're set up to Baylor in to do their language study. Two young Canadians working so hard on their Chinese language study could never have dreamed they would bring forth a young anthropologist, Isabel Crook, who would make studies of China. Yet 100 years later, their daughter can still recall her days in Bailuding. Isabel Crook, whose life has spanned over a century, anthropologist and author of Studies on China, has lived a remarkable life, matching her amazing age. Late in the Qing Dynasty, groups of Canadian missionaries boarded ships in Vancouver bound for Shanghai, where they travelled by boat up the Yangtze into Sichuan. In 1912, Isabel's father, Homer Brown, arrived in Chengdu, where he eventually became Dean of Education at West China Union University. So he's a farm boy. He was brought up on a farm. He's a good farmer. Very be very proud of being in the countryside. <laughs> Inheriting this family trait, Isabel held no fear for the hardships of rural life, joyfully spending long stints in Chinese villages to do research. Isabel's mother, Muriel Hockey, like her father, Homer Brown, graduated from Victoria College in Toronto. After her marriage, she founded the first Montessori kindergarten in China, now the Golden Fruit Kindergarten, and served on the boards of the Chengdu Deaf, Blind and Dumb School, now the Chengdu Special School, as well as the Chengdu Canadian School. In 1915, Muriel Brown founded the Dewey School, now the Hongzhuan Shilu Primary School. That same year, Isabel was born in a house across the road from the Sersheng Se Church. Her parents gave her a Chinese name, Rao Shu Mei, meaning kindly plum blossom. And indeed she was kindly and bold as the plum blossom. She was. She was a remarkable woman. And she had the worst conditions under which to do it. Muriel, who had set up schools and devoted herself to education, wished her daughter Isabel to continue this work and arrange for her to study child psychology back in Canada. I was interested in anthropology. For her master's degree, Isabel chose anthropology. On graduation at the age of 23, this smart young lady returned to China and decided to make a study of the Yi people in Sichuan's Hanyuan County. Yes, they're very, very supportive because they think if I want to be an anthropologist, that's a worthwhile thing to to be, I mean, to understand 
society and how you develop society. Yes, they were very supportive. I'm very lucky. <laughs> Later, Isabel hiked up the Min River Valley to make a study in the Jiarong Tibetan areas of Lishan. minorities in China. How do they live? What are their houses like? So I just arranged, I arranged to go and live in a farmhouse that was empty. And the owner of it organized his aunt to live with me. So the two of us lived in the, his house, his empty house. And you know, going across those rivers was very interesting because you could swing. There's a, a swing. Uh, Just swing across and you drop yourself quickly on that side because it's going to swing back. The ways of Shu are hard, harder than scaling the heavens. A young miss born in a large city to a Western missionary family, how was it she had the courage to hike in the wild hills, to brave the swift waters, to cross torrential rivers on a sliding cable? This is my Bailudia. We started going to Beilujin when we were very small. Every summer, Isabel's family would make a two to three day journey to Beiluding on foot. Beiluding was a very lovely place. <laughs> it was a lovely place, Beiluding. Oh, because it's Cool. And it's beautiful. Mm. And they fix it up. I mean, they have tennis courts and whatnot. So some people just go there and play tennis. and <laughs> Others go there, but they go, go climbing in the mountains mm -hmm. around. And that's, we were those that climbed in the mountains. When little Isabel's gaze peered beyond the clouds and forests and wild blossoms and saw the low thatched houses, the coolie carriers, the boatmen towing the boats up the rivers, it made her want to understand the mystery of how Chinese society was structured. In 1940, 25-year-old Isabel and 26-year-old Yu Shiji, two young beauties, one Chinese, one foreign, with sticks to beat off the dogs, went from house to house to survey the 1,500 households in the Village of Prosperity in Sichuan's Bishan County. 73 years later, 
in 2013. The seminal work, Prosperity's Predicament, Identity, Reform and Resistance in Rural Wartime China, the first socio-anthropological work to be co-authored by a Chinese and a Western woman, was published. This work revealed in great detail everyday life in the hinterland of China during the Japanese War. It well deserves to be required reading for the Republican period on the rural reconstruction movement. She recalls how at night time in prosperity there were always little specks of light. These were from carriers lighting up their opium pipes in the inns. For them, food was secondary to having their opium. While clearly against opium, Isabel didn't rush to accuse these hard-working carriers. They all smoked opium. They simply could not carry on without it. Isabel explains in her book, those peasants who had lost their land and become carriers sought relief from opium. It cured them of dysentery and gave them hope of more strength. Objective in her observations, Isabel was filled with sympathy for the common people. Where did this insight come from? On their way to Bailuding, little Isabel liked to engage the locals in conversation. Her grandmother, helping their cook's family go to school, sowed a seed of compassion in her heart. In 1942, Isabel married David Crook, who joined the British RAF. Later, she joined in the anti-fascist struggle by enlisting in the Canadian Army. Praise. But I'm very lucky, because yeah. David really, he, he doesn't see any difference between men and women. That, that it doesn't matter what they're able to do and what they want to do and what their emotions are. You know, he can just take them as, as they are, and I think that's one of the, his best, well, I shouldn't say best, it's one of his very good qualities. After demobilization in 1946, Isabel embarked on a PhD in anthropology at LSE under Professor Raymond Firth. In 1947, Isabel and David sailed the oceans, crossing the blockade to enter China's liberated areas, ending up in the village of Ten Mile Inn, deep in the Taihung Mountains of South Hebei. There they made a detailed study of the entire land reform process. She reported her findings to Professor Firth, working on her PhD. Who was to foresee that passing these materials would lead to her wrongful detention for three years during the Cultural Revolution? Of course, that was a very, uh, a very romantic, revolutionary time at that time. So everything was... Uh, Beautiful, you know, people were enthusiastic. And, mm, yes. So that's why so much was accomplished. Everybody was inspired. It's uh, an inspiring thing, you know. I think it's, you can do when you're inspired by the, you know, the support you're given by the local people. You know, it gives you a lot of energy. They used not only their pens and typewriters, but their cameras, making detailed and complete records. 
Ten Mile In, Revolution in a Chinese Village, was published in London. And 20 years later, Mass Movement in a Chinese Village was published in New York. These two valuable works help people in the West to learn the truth about China's land reform. Yes, well, we were working together. I mean, the work was done by both of us. Isabel and David not only wrote together, they also taught side by side. After their land reform study, they were invited by the CPC to stay and teach. Working together on the first English textbook in the New China, they helped train diplomats and English teachers, devoting themselves to the cause of education in China. After teaching, Isabel maintained her interest in rural development. Isabel and David paid two more visits to Ten Mile Inn in 1959 and 1961, leading to the book First Years of Yang Yi Commune, published in England in 1966. This was designated as required reading by many social anthropologists in Britain. From 2011 to 2015, aged between 96 and 100, Isabel carefully examined thousands of photos taken by David. For the text for the book, China Through the Lens of David Crook, 1938 to 1948. Analysis of her notes and studies gives her belief that rural and urban development should be balanced like yin and yang. Having lived through China's 20th century changes, the warlord period, the Japanese war, the war of liberation, socialist construction and reform and opening, the memory of Bai Lu Ding has accompanied Isabel through her rich and very life from where her dreams began. I mean, these mountains are, it takes quite a time to climb, climb up. And you have to go down each day to get your, buy your milk and whatnot. The legendary life of this 103-year-old Western anthropologist is itself a valuable record of China. Just as she nurtured the flowers in her garden each evening in Bailuding, Isabel Crook has nurtured those dreams her entire life. Yes, I thought it was valuable and I'm very proud that I did that because, you know, if you don't do it, it's, it might easily be completely lost. You've got to have some records. 
Isabel Brown was Canadian, she was born on one boy in Sichuan. Twenty-five years later she met David Cook in China, and later they were wed in London. Together they both worked as teachers, aided the struggle in many ways, as peasants and workers fought for their lives on the road. They joined with their Chinese comrades on the road that was often not straight. Unwavering as it got rocky, with commitment that was innate. Isabel Brown was Canadian. She was born long ago in Sichuan. Twenty-five years later, she met David Cook in China. Later, they were wed in London. Together, they both worked as teachers, aided the struggle in many ways. As peasants and workers fought for their lives on the road to build another day. <laughs> 